if you want more people to stand for the anthem, change the song. That's half the problem right there. It's just the lyrics to the anthem. We can stand to any song. Patriotism is a feeling. Let's not forget that. Patriotism ain't no one song. For as long as we stand and agree that people died for us to kick it, we can do that to any song. You can do that to Bruno Mars. What's more American than Bruno Mars? They say America is a melting pot. Well, damn it, I want to stand to Bruno Mars. He literally looks like every race at the same time. What's better than that? What's more American than us standing with a Hawaiian, Mexican, white, lesbian, Jewish man? I feel like I've done well enough for myself that if I died tomorrow, my kid would probably be okay and could go to college. I don't consider that making it. Like, the irony is that when I started, I was always struggling to find a safe place to sleep. Now I have no time to sleep. This script needs to be in. These jokes need to be together because there are 10,000 more people right now as we speak sleeping in their car waiting to replace me, and they can't have it. So I got to work a million times harder than I did in 1998 to stay here. I didn't want to do comedy, and that's the honest to God truth. I was in theater ever since I was a kid, and I wanted to be an actress. And then my mother got into stand-up, and she got me into it. It's not easy. I've lost teeth, look. I had teeth when I got in the game, uh, both sides. You're gonna be poor. I was homeless. I didn't take calls from my family for almost a year, because I didn't want them to know I was homeless. Uh, I used to be a stripper. Uh, oh, thank you, that feels good. People always want me to be embarrassed about it. Yeah, well, I am. <laughs> it's just that I'm embarrassed for a different reason. I'm embarrassed because I was a broke stripper. Uh, yeah, because I don't have tits and ass, and they don't like that in the black clubs. <laughs> but I insisted anyway, you know? But if God tells you that your demographic is 35-year-old Russians, believe him. And I was making no money. At one time, I was crying on the floor of the locker room, and one of the big titty money-making bitches came up to me, and she was like, oh, don't cry. Next time, use your personality. <laughs> Which was insulting enough, but my dumb self didn't realize that personality is industry speak for blowjob. So I was in the strip club being myself. <laughs> hey, don't be yourself in the strip club. They don't want yourself in the strip club. I'm at the bar talking to customers. I'm like, well, this tattoo's from a book of James Baldwin essays. <laughs> Okay, um, I started stand-up because I was a junior in college. I was extremely depressed. I'd gone through so many things that year, and I lost all my friends. I alienated so many people, and I thought I should do something that makes me happy, and I couldn't think of anything that made me happy except for stand-up. I just went online, randomly bought a joke writing workshop. I did a couple mics, and I've been doing stand-up since. The new generation came up in the bringer era. They would have bookers say like, yeah, you could perform at this club. Just bring 10 to 12 people. You do five minutes and we tape it. And then we would have this notion like, whoa, yeah, I'm gonna be at the club. I'm gonna get past here. At a bringer show after a while, you start to learn what the difference between fans and fucking family. It's two different things. Fans pay tickets to see you. Family just came out to support you. And that's how it was. I would feel like I was king. I was killing it like, hell yeah, man, I killed Caroline's. I could go do the cellar now. What's up? And I think I did the cellar open mic, bombed. And it's good to get broken down by bombing because that helps you figure out like, this is real, man. No, you're not the next thing. You, you need to be an artist. You're performing with acts that are all at different trajectories in their career. Some guys are on the way up, some guys are on the way down. Like, one week you're performing and opening for Tommy Davidson, and the next week you're opening for somebody who should have been Tommy Davidson. So I grew up in comedy with constant reminders of what the pros and cons are of the choices that I would make, from women to drugs to how you treat the staff, you know, all of that stuff. 
Let me tell you how bad I wanted to do comedy. We drove from Kansas City. All they gonna pay us is $50. Kansas City to Oklahoma. Shit, that, that's a drive. Uh, we talking two, two and a half, you know, it's, it's, it's a drive. So, you know, we got the music blasting, talk shit in the car. That's back when I smoked cigarettes, smoked cigarettes. So, we get to the club. It is a hit. They got chicken wire over the stage. Huey B went on first. They booed his ass off. They throwing fucking bottles at the chicken wire. So I'm backstage. I need this $50, though, so shit. I come out. You get the N-word, all that shit. I said, oh, really? Yeah, you motherfuckers. I said, I ain't scared of you redneck sons of bitches. And I started doing this character, Redneck. I said, last name Neck, first name Red. My name is Redneck, goddamn right, boy. All them motherfuckers started howling then. But they wasn't catching it. I was clowning they motherfucking asses. So anyway, when I got done <laughs> picking with the hicks, I remember they's, uh, they's bringing the money, and I'm out in the back. I said, you get the car. I had the motherfucker started. I'm going to get the motherfucking $100. So we getting the fuck up out this bitch. And we got that $100, and we just seen some rocks coming off the back tires. Michelle Obama got a book out. She on tour. Yeah. I tried to get a ticket to the, the Michelle Obama shit. It's like $210. $210. I love Michelle Obama, but for $210, she better eat me out at that fucking concert. You know what I mean? Like, you better make America great again and start with me, bitch. <laughs> you know, I was the last, I think the last of the Mohicans from like that whole 80s revival of comedy. And when people like, you worked to get on stage, and you worked to be at a club. Finally, like, okay, now I'm ready to present this, you know, set, have somebody see it. Now people are like, five seconds in the game. I don't know why I ain't made it yet. Well, nigga, you just started. But I get it because there's so many TV outlets now. Like when I, you know, when I was a kid, well, how many channels they had? Two, three, now you can pop in, you can watch all the time. And so there's so many outlets for comics that people are like, well, I see this comic and this is their trajectory on how, you know, they moved and I should be moving the same thing. People are uh, now are like watching a lot of formats and templates of how people are making it and trying to do the same thing and then expecting the same results. That's why I hate when people try to shortcut themselves. The only way you're gonna be able to get comfortable in front of an audience is to be in front of a bunch of audiences. Writing is one of the main things I, I focused on the past four years, because you really want to have something to say and just keep pushing the art forward instead of just having observational humor, because observational humor is dead. Social media killed that. Memes, YouTube, like, when your side chick calls your phone, what do you do? I mean, that's, that's observational shit. To where you have, like, a Kevin Hart who will tell you about living with his wife and his kids, or you'll have a Chris Rock about growing up in the schools, being the only black kid. You have Dave Chappelle telling you about his experience in DC with the crack baby. Stories, fucking stories. And then I would tell the story about me living with my sister then who transitioned to my brother. I love my brother, my brother's transgender. Transitioned from a woman to a man years ago. Love him very much. Oh, thank you. All right. Cool, cool. I, I'll tell him you can. <laughs> I love him. I, I, I love that he loves his body, and I'm happy that he loves his body. He loves his body so much, he loves to brag to me now. He'll come up to me like, look, man, I got more facial hair than you. <laughs> I got more armpit hair than you. I didn't know he transitioned into an asshole. <laughs> I got gay, but you ain't got a flex on me. <laughs> Damn. You know, it felt like, felt like, it's like I was at the end of The Little Mermaid, and the mermaid's like, what's up, Ariel? And she's like, oh, y'all bitches still got flippers? <laughs> I would tell that story. Not his story, but my perspective of living with a transgender brother. And that resonated with people because they never heard that before. And I feel like that's what stand-ups have. That's what stand-ups will always have. Have fun with the observational humor, but have a fucking story. Have a voice where people are like, yo, that's the nigga with the fucking sis, bro. They don't even know your name. They just know you by the bit. And that's even an honor. I live with a millennial. Pray for me. <laughs> My brother is 15 years younger than me. He moved in with me. Every day, I wish I dropped him. 
Every day he makes me feel like I'm a bad person, right? He's always checking me about things that I didn't know were now out of vogue. Another day he walks into the living room, he has on a, a peach t-shirt. He goes, Chloe, what do you think about this shirt? Is it too feminine? I'm like, no, it's a regular peach t-shirt. He goes, trick question, gender's fluid. Get out of my house! Social media is the automobile when everybody was still riding carriages. It's a thing that you don't want to need, but then it becomes so crucial to your survival that you have to adapt. It's frustrating. It's frustrating because as a comic, you're out every night, like literally out every night, busting your ass, pumping through these cities. I've done so many shit gigs at bars in the middle in fucking West Virginia, and you're truly busting your ass trying to develop a skill so that you can be called a comic. Right? And you finally earn that title where it's like, you consider yourself a comedian, your peers see you, they consider you a comedian. And then you have these people who create funny sketches about, you know, oh, here's this nigga's dick print in sweatpants. It's sweatpants season or some shit like that, which is, it's cute. So it really watered down the craft, but they want to be called comedians as well. And it's just like, oh, who am I to knock somebody else's hustle? For me now, there's two things about the millennials and the new Instagram. 355,000 Instagram likes by people who will never pay a ticket to come and see you do not a comedian make, I don't feel. The millennials that's coming through now, they got entourages of 10 to 15 people. They want to get paid. They don't put no respect on your name. They treat us like you're washed the fuck up on the new shit. What we know that they don't know is that 30 years from now, you ain't gonna be able to sell out no motherfucking room 30 years from now. And 30 years from now, we still be able to do it. To me, it feels like it stems from bitterness, where they just see like a young kid with 500K followers, and they would get mad at what the IG comics did. I never did, because they are hustling. They, they doing what they do. God bless them, man. Like, if you just being true to yourself and it's genuine, people will gravitate towards you. Of course, I'm gonna, I'm gonna big up my crew. Um, I roll with a really funny crew of comedians. I think we're all very talented. That would be Monroe Martin, Hadia Robinson, Yamanika Sanders. You know, we're taking a page out of like the Anna, Adam Sandler handbook of Spike Lee. It's like, we're going to do projects and work together and promote each other and share each other's content and really do what we need to do, which is have a strong core of us so that if one person blows up, you're gonna already have people that you can move into the project. You know, it's like family. You wish the best for them sometimes. There's sometimes you feel like people are hacky. Sometimes you feel like people are joke thieves. It's very collaborative, and then at the same time, it's very lonely, too. It, it, it's really about what you, how you go about it, you know? You know, you look at Ken Ivy Wayans, Robert Townsend, those guys, Eddie, those guys, they did create a lot of stuff. They sat down with each other in trailers and different places working on scripts. And I think the collaborative effort went away, too, because everybody wanted to be a rock star. They all wanted to be Martin had their own show like Martin, it's my show, you have your show. Like, you wasn't collabing, people wasn't collabing together. I remember Issa said something, don't Issa Rae, she said people always let it try to network up instead of networking with the people that's right next to them or working with the people that's right next to them. And you get more done that way. Instead of trying to chase this person that this, that's looked at as this, oh, this is the person that can change my life because they did all this other stuff instead of just like, so what if we, can we become those people? The improvement comes in drips. And at, at any given time, even today, there's only two or three comics making crazy money. Not Kevin Hart's the man. They used to, they always find one, and that one gets all the work. They always find one, because they won't let it be two or three. Look how many white actors get to work. But with but us, been a time when you were that one. I wasn't. Hollywood never put me in that group. I busted my, everything I found, we worked, we worked, we worked. When I did the Sinbad show, 1994, our first TV shows were naive. We think comedy writers are like comedians. We think they're fun people. Comedy writers sit in a room like this. So I'll come in, I didn't realize they didn't want me in the room. And I finally had a cat got me hip. He said, dude, you know, they're mad at you because they don't want you in the room. I said, well, why wouldn't they want me in the room? And he said, they don't want your opinion. They just want you to be a performing monkey. Just get on set and perform. I said, well, that ain't never going to be me. You know, I wasn't trying to do a sitcom. I had gotten to deal with Disney. 
and Drew Wall said, now they're gonna tell you they wanna do a show with you. Whatever you do, don't you pitch a good show. We're gonna make movies. I said, yeah, Joe. So I didn't know how not to pitch. I was just making up stuff. I'm gonna be a single man and I'm adopting, I adopt two kids. I'm a video game developer and I, I, I'm on the internet. And they were looking at me. I said, good, we out. He goes, yeah. I said, they bought this? I told my brother, I messed up, they bought it. I said, Joe, goes, what'd you do? I said, they bought it. But then they got mad because it was about a black man adopting kids. It's about black kids in foster care. The whole show was about to show how this man had to quit being selfish. And, and he went from being a playboy and raising kids. I already had the 10-year plan in my head. The girl that was on the show with me that played the woman that worked with me was Summer Hayek. I said, we do this right. By the third year, we get married. Now it's the first Latin and black family kind of on TV. We could have mixed all that, because that's how they live in New York. And I had this plan, and they were like this. That ain't gonna happen. I didn't realize it was a fight. They didn't want intelligent. I think when Chappelle show came up with Sketch, America and the world was waiting for what would be the next big thing. And Chappelle show came at that time. The writing process with Chappelle was, if you had a premise for an idea, for a sketch or something, you would pitch the premise. And then if Neil and Dave liked it, they would write on it. How did Ashley Larry come together? On paper, he was just Larry. He was just a dude that was struggling to pay his rent and would do anything for it. I knew that whatever I did, I had to be funny when you first saw me. And when I was younger, I used to shoot dice a lot and my mom would bust me. She'd be like, were you shooting dice? I'm like, no. She was like, yes, you were. Look at how ashy your legs are, your knees are. So I put the ash in the Larry. I didn't tell anybody that I was going to be that ash. When we came to set that day, I went to makeup. I was like, I need baby powder. I had a handful of baby powder. I didn't want to tell them and I was going to do it because I didn't want to take a chance of saying it's too sloppy, it won't work. So I was just like, I was just going to roll the dice. So I shook my hand. I had the powder in my hand and I blew it out in front of the camera. They caught it and Neil Brent looked at me. He was like, that was it. And that's when Ashley Larry was born. We were friends. Like, we had fun. And out of all the projects I've done in my career, I can't remember a project where we would work 16, 17 hour days, and it never ever felt like work. It felt like a group of guys getting together and just making the world laugh.